Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world. Still waiting for that Joey Votto, Magnus Carlson picture. I'm Jake Vince. That's Jordan Schusterman. And on today's episode, we bid farewell to Joseph Daniel Votto, baseball man. And we welcome uh, yeah. Joseph Daniel Votto, true man of the world. Yes. One door opens, time, one door closes. Full-time content creator. Uh, a wonderful intro. And I think now, like, the odds of the Magnus Carlson, Joey Votto photo just went up. I mean, now there's more time for him to make his way over to Norway and and make that picture happen. We are going to talk about Joey Votto's um, somewhat abrupt, somewhat perfect retirement uh, that occurred since we last recorded. We are going to talk about the Mariners parting ways with Scott Service, which as a, as, as a Mariners fan is weird uh, because I don't really know much else besides Scott Service. So that I'm, I'm not excited <laughs> to talk about, but it is certainly good podcast fodder. Uh, we'll talk about Perry Manassi and sticking around in Anaheim, and it's Friday, so we got the good, the bad, the ugly, and maybe I'll even sprinkle in a little Little League World Series championship preview at the very end, Jake. But let's begin with Joey Votto. In Be- let's begin, yeah. yes, in Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> let's begin in the parking lot of Salem Field, <laughs> where Joey Votto earlier this week, uh, after playing. I believe on Tuesday or Wednesday, he has been in AAA with the Blue Jays for a few weeks now. He went over three on Tuesday and he decided, uh, I am done playing baseball. Joey Votto, who turns 41 in a couple of weeks, then posted a video on his Instagram saying, I am retiring from baseball. He then drove up beyond the border to visit his friends with the Cincinnati Reds who had just completed a series in Toronto very conveniently. I don't know if that was just, you know, serendipity that it worked out that way that he was able to drive up and, you know, hug Freddy Benavides and (laughs) say goodbye to his friends with the Reds and, and also speak to both the Reds and Blue Jays media. I think that that worked out very well. And I think that'll be part of this conversation too. We're going to zoom out, of course, and talk about his career, but we have already kind of heard Joey talk very, as always, eloquently about this decision beyond his, you know, five second Instagram farewell. So, uh, Jake, there's there's a lot to get to here. This is obviously someone who we've talked to plenty about as his career has has wound down on this show, and also when he his career ended with the Reds. And I'm going to talk about that, of course, because I got to saw it up close and we signed with the Blue Jays. We've had some Joey Votto reflections over the last year already, but now that we have reached a final you know chapter here, uh, that there's a lot there's a lot to take in. And I, I've said this before, but Joey Votto's legacy is is overwhelming in different ways because, you know, you sent me some of some stories this morning, like his off the field per- personality is so unique and so special. And hopefully we'll still get to see it that you just hardly even know where to begin because of how much he's kind of brought to us as a character and as a, as a person, as a mind who thinks about baseball, that it's nice that now today the first thing we can do is be like, oh, my God, this dude was so good for so long. What is the point of any of this, right? Uh, Hitting a home run doesn't actually mean anything removed from the context of it. And what I am left with when thinking about Joey Votto is that he meant and means so much to so many people in a place. And that is the purpose of the endeavor. And I know that Votto himself focused and loved playing he he talked so much about how much he loved being in the box right and participating and competing but i'm left with the emotion of people who got to experience daniel Votto, joseph daniel Votto, excuse me danny um <laughs> who were around to like let that mean a lot and i'm curious for you mm-hmm. let's start at the end you know you spend last year around the reds a lot Mm -hmm. tell me about how that fan base and the staff and the stadium workers and 
the people around the Reds, besides Votto, handled what, even at the time, was an inevitable ending. Yeah. And so just to write some context, you know, I lived uh, about an hour and a half from Cincinnati starting in the summer of 2022. And this I actually got there, I believe, right after he had had season ending shoulder surgery. And that is a very important part of the end of the Joey Votto story. And we should still go back and like talk about what he accomplished. And, and we'll do that in a second. But but since you, you know, kind of let me down this path, I'll obviously cover that now. At that point, he was 38, right? He had was about to turn 39. He would turn 39 when I was there. This is when Joey Votto decides I'm going to have season ending, you know, labrum surgery. It was not, he was not playing well. He was very injured. And this is when we see him go in the TV booth. We see him just popping into broadcast and doing multiple Reds games. We see him walking around the stadium. <laughs> I was, I believe I was there for that game and just saying, like, oh, where's Joey? Like, oh, he's just sitting in right field wearing, a, I believe, a Barry Larkin jersey, <laughs> um, which is really cool. This is when Joey starts to kind of, we start, not that he hadn't already introduced himself as like this care, but like now it's like we start thinking about, is Joey thinking about the end? You know, is he thinking about what's next? Because when you get shoulder surgery at, at that age, you know, it's like, all right, like, we don't know for sure if he's going to come back. Now, it's also important to remember that this dude was ridiculously good in 2021. And I think that is a very important context to remember that even at age 37, he got MVP votes. He had a 938 OPS. He had, you know, these incredible home run streaks. Like, he was not peak Joey Votto, but pretty damn close, right? And so that was very important. Because that was not so removed to the point where Joey Votto thought, I'm still good. I was just injured. But he also recognized that coming back from serious shoulder surgery at this age is no small thing. But he managed to do it. He managed to come back. He managed to get back onto the team in 2022 when, or in 2023 when the tone is very different because the Reds now, by the time he comes back, have Matt McLean, have Ellie De La Cruz. They are winning a lot in June. And now it's like, okay, this is awesome. Joey's a part of this. And Joey talked about like, I don't want to be dead weight here. Like I got to contribute. I have to perform. That's that's the point. I'm not just here to get a send off. Ultimately, he he's okay. You know, he's got a you know av league average OPS. He's mostly hitting against righties. He's contributing, but he's not an impact player anymore, but he's contributing. And then at the end, it becomes clear, like, this is going to be the end of Joey in Cincinnati. And I, being around for that, being around for his first game back when he homered, being around for his last game at the end of this last home game, if you recall, his last actual game was on the road and he got ejected. So that's a very funny thing <laughs> in retrospect. But I went back and, you know, watched some of the videos of him at the, at the very end. And the ovation he got before his last at bat. And you talked about kind of just to kick it back to you here for a second, talk about that connection of meeting so many to so many people in a place. And I talked about this on the pod at the time, but when Joey did that ovation and he talked about after looking around and just like recognizing so many people, you know, that's a unique thing. You know, not that other people players who play in one place don't have that connection, but that was really what felt uniquely um special about Joey plus Cincinnati. And it worked out that we all knew it was going to kind of be the ending there. There was some question about, oh, you know, should he, did the Reds owe him? Do they have to bring him back no matter what? But I think that it was very much in Cincinnati. Everyone understood. There were no hard feelings. If you weren't in there and you said, oh, this is a disgrace. that they're No, 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 no. Like Joey understood that like there was not a place for him there anymore. But he still thought again, because 2020 wasn't that long ago, I want to still play. And that kind of brings us uh, to this year where... It's clear he's not going to be with the Reds, but it also is clear there's not going to be that many places for him. He signs with the Blue Jays. He battles injuries a couple times along the way. He's 40 years old. And this brings us to the to the retirement. And I promise we'll go back and talk about why he's an obvious Hall of Famer in a second. But this is really what's so fascinating to me here is one of the quotes that he gave um, talking to the media yesterday. I just I just. Again, I, I've said this before about Joey and, and getting to be around him. There's so few players that I actually care about every single word they have to say. <laughs> He's, he is the one, right? Where it's like when Joey talks, you listen. And I thought that this quote was really telling. 
He said, it's a physical game, 100%. It doesn't matter how you think you can outwit someone. You have to be physical. There's no chess in this game. And Joey Votto would know. Whatsoever, this is a heavyweight fight with limited tactics involved and physical trumps everything and physical is not there for me. And that is an incredible look into the mind of who we like to think about as one of the most meticulous kind of cerebral hitters. And I'm sure he is that also. And there's evidence of that as well. But he's like, listen, it's not happening for me anymore. <laughs> I'm injured. I'm old. I'm hurt. I'm slow. I don't belong here anymore. And when he realized that, he decided it was time. And that phrase in his Instagram farewell retirement announcement, mm -hmm. I'm not good anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not good anymore. Joey Votto did not want to be actively bad. At the big yeah. league level. Yeah. He held himself to too high a standard. And I think that if he had wanted a big league taste with Toronto, he could have gotten it. Like the Blue Jays stink and they probably would have called him up and given him that moment. But he wanted to earn it. Right. And I respect the heck out of that. And for him to say, no, thank you. I'd rather yeah. hang him up this way is very, right. very cool. And yeah. And the last thing I'll say about that, like, is in the same way that there were fans that were, and I, I understand this response if you're not following this so closely, but I understand in the same way that the disconnected fans were like, Cincinnati should be ashamed for not bringing him back on a, on a one-year deal. The same way they'd be like, Toronto should be ashamed for not calling him up to one game. It's like, no, because that's not what Joey wants. He's not looking for just the, you know, like he, it, it, it went out the way that it was supposed to. And while, you know, in some ways, we'll kind of look back and be like, oh, remember when he played, you know, 40 minor league games in 2024? That baseball reference page will stay untarnished. It will say one, one team in the same way that I feel about Felix Hernandez with the Braves and Orioles. And we will hopefully forget that because he never actually pitched for them in the regular season. I think it is okay and good that Joey Votto never actually played for the Blue Jays. Do you know who Joey Votto's final professional home run in the minor leagues was off? No, I don't. Uh, he hit two this year, I think. But no, tell me, Johan Ramirez. What a <laughs> fitting ending! He his last homer yeah. was yeah. off a big leaguer. It just yeah. happened to be in the minor leagues. Okay, so let's turn the clock back. Yeah, why was Toronto so important to Joey Votto? Well, he is from Canada. Mm -hmm. He was a second round pick out of a Canadian high school. I believe the name of the town. Dig into the mind is Etobicoke. From Tobacco, the, uh, silent, oh. silent K. Yeah, yeah. That I that took me a while before I knew that. Um, but I was also just in Canada, so I that's I a, a tricky, bit, no, that's there's a tricky some, one. There's some, there's some that, tough, there's some tough pronunciations, uh, for some of those Toronto <laughs> suburbs. Still kind of getting familiar, yeah. That pronunciation is like 150 stuff plus, like you just have to be prepared for it. <laughs> yes, um, so he's yes. picked by the Reds out of a high school in Canada. Debuts in 2007 and is pretty immediately really good. Rookie of the year, runner up in 08, MVP in 10, runner up to Stanton in 2017 by one vote, essentially, when Stanton hits 59 homers, leads the league in OBP seven times. And, you know, the obvious question now becomes is he a Hall of Famer? We're going to say yes. Now, I you have a good comparison on here, which is Lance Berkman. Okay. So the numbers are pretty similar. I would say that Votto's defense and base running gives him more overall career war than Bergman had because he was providing more value. But as hitters, it's not dissimilar. Okay, Should Bergman have gotten a bigger sniff at the Hall? Yes. But there are obviously differences between these two players. And I just want to say, like, I saw some Astros fans, even in our mentions, about how unfortunate it is that Votto is getting, will get so much support and Bergman didn't, right? And we can debate the merits of these two players or these two people all day long. But if your dude doesn't get in, why should that preclude you from supporting you. someone Thank else to get in? Just because you don't go to heaven doesn't mean you don't want anybody else to. You know, like <laughs> <Yeah>. it's <laughs> well, it, well, the better the better way to put it is just like it's not Joey Votto's fault that people didn't vote Lance Berkman. Don Mattingly, Will Clark, whatever other first baseman you think is getting shafted by Joey getting in and them not. It's not like all of these are separate. 
And that's something that I think one of my strongest Hall of Fame beliefs, as I have slowly cared about this less <laughs> since I wrote my senior thesis on it, <laughs> is yeah. like, we should want these to celebrate these guys and while while i'm not saying there's no room for like hall of fame debate like it is an interesting exercise to compare the careers and the accolades and be like oh like the like i'm not saying that there's no room for that however if it's just as simple as well if he didn't get in then you can't get in like that's that's so silly like it just, it doesn't make any sense it's not lance berkman has nothing to do with how special joey Votto was like that right. that logically makes no sense just because they both have a 144 ops plus for their career and I feel bad for the type of person who, if Joey Votto on the first time on the ballot gets 73% and doesn't get in, who's a Lance Berkman Hardo? They're like, heck yeah, like, boo, Va like, right. no, that's just no. the wrong right. way to approach this thing. So I just right. hope that people don't do that. And I think that the argument for Votto, right, if you look at his numbers, he's right up there with McCovey in terms of first base baseball reference war. I think that the other argument for him is 17 years with one team, right? We will not be having a debate about whether what hat Joey Votto is going to wear <laughs> no, on his plaque. Yeah, yeah. Won't and be I the think, Bisons. No, and I think that, like, it helps. It's a reminder. Like, I'm fine with that mattering. I think that that's cool. I think that what we've seen over the last couple of years or recently with Todd Helton and Joe Maurer, two guys with also very comparable, if you just go statistically, like if Joe Maurer is getting in first ballot, I love Joe Maurer. I said, hell yeah, put him in first ballot. Like, and I know that's a catch versus first baseman, but like, I know it took Helton a lot longer, but those are guys that mean so much to those places. And Joey's going to be one of the great examples of that, of this generation of baseball. And that was something I kind of wanted to wrap with, but yeah, I mean that, that as far as credentials go, like, he is uh, seven OBP titles is is ridiculous. I mean, that's that is an incredible yeah. achievement uh, in, in, you know, in this day and age. And, and the power was there. And if he does win that second MVP, which is literally like a vote difference, you know, now we're having a different conversation because two MVPs is, is a lot different than one uh, when you're talking about these things. So I don't think it's really a question. And the biggest takeaway, yeah, is I, I just wish we would stop bringing up other people when we're talking about these guys, because it's just that's just not it's I don't it's against the spirit of it, in my opinion. Putting Votto in Cooper Sound doesn't devalue the entire no. thing. It really doesn't. And if you think no, it does, God, I of course not. Oh don't know gosh, what to tell but, you. Yeah, uh, yeah. OK, so yeah. let's spin it forward. Mm hmm. What is next for Joey Votto? We've talked about the end. We've talked about why he chose to retire. We've talked about the special player he was. But I think what's interesting as we move forward with Votto is what he chooses to do next. Part of what made Votto such a special character is that he was a special character. That beyond the box, he was entertaining us more than a lot of other players were. His interviews were must-see. Anytime he opened his mouth, like you mentioned, you had to listen. Baseball players, respectfully, as someone who now spends a lot of time around them listening to them speak, can be insightful. Very few baseball players are insightful all of the time. And that is because quite often when they are asked a question, sometimes their priority in responding is let me finish this conversation as quickly as possible. And that totally. is why we fall back on cliche all the time. Right. It is easier. And I understand this example. Aaron Judge homers yesterday. What a player. Amazing post game. You know, I hit in this kind of lineup like it's you know, it just makes it life so easy. Like I'm just want to help the team win. Like Aaron has to do that crap every day. I understand the processes that lead to a relatively snooze fast answer. Whatever. Votto never did, did that. Never. He was like, incapable. Was, he he could. He, he couldn't do was it. was so no matter what the setting was, again, in my my limited experience, and I recognize that the, his the way he handled pressers at, at the end of his career was was a lot more with, with the understanding that there was a lot more gravity to the situation. But also talking to Reds media, this has been true forever, right? Or at least a very long time. He can he can't give a canned answer. That's just it's not in his DNA. And so, like, even if it was a boring question. He would, he would, he would give you something that was more than the question, which is so rare. <laughs> the nugget from the athletic oral history, which I recommend everyone goes and reads, about how he took improv classes 
yeah. to better interact with the teammates in the media is just phenomenal. And you see that, I believe, the interview he does with Mad Dog where he goes on the rant about how Mad Dog said he was in the Hall of Very Good. That is <laughs> literally related to his improv class. And there was a whole <laughs> thread, actually, from, I believe, the comedian in in Toronto that like set him up with those improv classes. There is a lot of Twitter just like people coming out and telling their Joey Vado stories, which is great, obviously. But yeah, that that's just one of many. But that's why I say, like, where do you even begin? <laughs> where do you so, even begin when you want to pick your favorite Joey Votto anecdote? And as we move forward, what is next for him? I mean, I don't think we'll see him for the rest of the year. I think he yeah. should go take a nap and read he the also big coffee does some table books. Travel, so I wouldn't be surprised yeah, if like, he's just like in Iceland in three days. <laughs> like drinking wine. Underrated Joey Votto thing is that his mom is a sommelier. Yes. One of my yes. favorite Votto nuggets. Okay, so he could really do anything. He could. We could just hear from him once a year, and he could enjoy the heck out of his life and travel and drink good wine and hang out with his friends and play chess and show up uh, at Great American Ballpark every once in a while and throw out a first pitch. Right? Like, that's totally a legitimate life. I wouldn't fault him for that. Great players have done that. I would feel robbed. And maybe that is selfish <laughs> because he is a celebrity and it yeah. is his own life, whatever. But yeah. as someone who follows the game, I want Joey Votto's insight and perspective around it because I think it makes it a better place. He has given so much to the sport and this world and this community, and I just want that to continue. So is he going to be on national broadcasts on the mic? Maybe. Is he going to go work for a team and help with development? Maybe. I found a quote from that athletic article, Jordan, that I sent mm -hmm. you. He said, I want about him learning Spanish and like buying Rosetta Stone. I want to be able to work in the Dominican. I want to be able to work in the Arizona Summer League. I want to maybe work in a minor league system one day and help a younger group. Right? Like I, sure, maybe. It's it's all on the table. And that is what is exciting. And to your point, like, it's not about us. Joey should do whatever the hell he wants. Um, but like, it's not like people aren't going to try to get him on TV. You know, I imagine there are already meetings happening today with anyone who's broadcasting postseason baseball about how we can get Joey Votto involved. Right. That feels extremely likely. Now, it's possible he will want to do that this year and maybe we'll see him on a wild card game. It's possible he will just disappear and go travel. I think the fact that he now is still on social media and posting the way that he does makes me feel like we'll at least be getting fairly regular <laughs> check-ins in a yeah. pretty entertaining way. And so that that gives me hope. Doesn't um, he have to do a podcast with Foolish Baseball, isn't that? Oh, that's true. I know that, starting that is a pod something. Together. Foolish has done a lot, but I guess he has not. He's been done our podcast. He's hosted our podcast. Can we maybe I think that, that is a running. I think that's a running bit of Bailey's, which is that he no, would I only know. start a podcast if Joey did if, it with him. If Joey Votto is 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 the only guest, is the co-host, I don't know what the oh, what no. the parameters are um, of that. But but that's the thing. And I would just say the last thing I'll I'll say about Votto is, and you know this this applies to a few things, and it'll somewhat apply to our Scott Service conversation. But anyone who is in one place for a long time and just has that kind of longevity and has any sort of personal connection. Uh, it's just, there's a lot to kind of take in when, when you finally get to the end. And for me personally, you know, my wife grew up a Reds fan. And when I met her in college 10 years ago, like Joey Votto is of course, one of the first players we talk about. And I remember that the two things that I just think back on, when I think about Joey Votto's just career looking ahead, one, you know, with Bailey was just like looking ahead and being like, was we realized like, okay, yeah, we're, we're probably going to, you know, be a, be a, together and married and whatever. It's just like, what is our life going to be like when Joey Votto retires, right? Because at that point, it's like, it's like, man, like that's a long time for now, like 2023. Like, are we going to make it that far? You know, like that's that's already funny. Um, I have a vivid memory. Yes, vivid yes. memory. I think I know. Yes. You know what I'm going to say. This is I was to my brother. Yes. Yes. So yes. when Votto yes. signs the extension, yes, in 2012. Okay. Yes. This is We're before in high school. the Cespedes Family Barbecue existed. Like it wasn't, yes. it was not on the internet. We were just yes. friends. And he signs this 10 year extension. And I think you say, by the time that extension ends, my brother will have graduated college. 
that's exact. Well, I think it ended up being slightly wrong. It was off by like a year, but <laughs> that is true. My brother's graduated college, and and here we are. And again, like at that yeah. point, your your perception of time as high schoolers is all wonky. But that Joey Votto was still in Cincinnati at the end. That I was living near Cincinnati to watch the end of that. You know, with you know, with my my wife who's a Reds fan, her, her dad's a lifelong Reds fan, like um her brother Ben's like like loves Joey Votto. Like all these things is just like it's so bizarre and and cool and personal that we ended up at this place. And I've just talked about how great I feel to have seen the end of it, but it's fitting. And as you said, I hope that's not it. I, I can't wait to see what is next for him. Whatever, whatever that is, uh, it will be great because Joey Votto is obviously uh great. So uh cheers to you, Joey. We we hope to see you again on either our Instagram feeds or on national television as soon as possible. But live your life, my man. You have earned every single ounce of it. We are going to take a quick break, and when we return on baseball barbercast, uh, we're gonna be a little bit less. Uh, excited to talk about Scott Service being relieved of his duties. Duties. And welcome back to Baseball Barbercast. Why are we saying relieved of his duties, dog? Like, Service got fired. Okay, maybe that That's, word is yeah. a little bit too fierce. But, and maybe his tenure deserves uh, a kinder phrase than <laughs> canned. However, let's let's call it what it is. The manager of the Seattle Mariners, Scott Service, was uh, let go. <laughs> he was laid off. Service out. Service out. <laughs> End of service. Uh, uh, this, okay. I'm going to start because mm -hmm. you probably have a lot of things to say. No, no. Go ahead. Please set, set, set that stage, baby. I'm going to fire up. Producer Andrew Hartz, I want like a, like a sound drop, like an old school sports talk radio sound drop. The multiple things can be true horn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the multiple things can be true, Horn. Multiple things can be true. Scott Service had a successful tenure as the manager of the Seattle Mariners. I believe this to be a fact. Also, I believe that this was the only thing the Mariners could have done right now. Not the only thing. Let me take that back. This was a wise move given the context of their current state, given how their season has gone over the last two months. I have no issue with the firing. However, I don't think it is fair to pretend like Scott Service, who was there for nine years, tied for the second longest tenured manager in baseball, was some sort of bumbling fool. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I would use the word wise move. Certainly an understandable move, right? I think we don't know if it's a wise yeah. move and that we don't know. But I think, I think what you just said is fair. And I think that, as you mentioned, um, yeah, this dude's been there since 2016. Dave Roberts and him are the two second longest tenure managers. Kevin Cash uh, was there a year before. That's a long time. We see a lot of manager turnover. The I believe the, the Mets have had six managers <laughs> since Scott Service was hired. That is including Carlos Beltran, to be fair. Um, but you know, the Padres have had five. Like Teams are churning through these guys a lot now. And so if you can stick around, you're doing something right. And with all due respect to Bud Black and his situation in Colorado, which hasn't included a ton of winning and he's still there, uh, normally it's because you're winning. And the Mariners have been winning. Again, the big picture we'll get to, but they have the eighth most wins in baseball over the last four seasons. He has a lot of his teams overperformed their expected winning percentage, you know, expected win percentage, which is usually a sign of probably some pretty good managing. And ultimately, until this year, they had accomplished a, a lot that they hadn't previously, including, of course, reaching the postseason, breaking the drought in 2022. And that is a season that, as bad as it has gotten over the last two years, does not disappear, does not go away. It was still a very special experience for the fans. And Scott's service was absolutely a huge part of that. Um, but it brings us to why we are talking about this on the podcast today. Just for context. Yeah. I'm going to read the lineup from Scott Service's first game in charge. Oh, well, this was another big point I wanted to make. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Leading off, okay. Nori Aoki, shortstop, mm -hmm. Cattell Marte, mm -hmm. second base, Robinson Cano, Nelson Cruz, Kyle Seeger, D.H. Franklin Gutierrez, First base, Adam Lynn. Goody was still playing? 
let that, off. That like breaks my brain. Okay, yeah. Chris Iannetta behind yeah. the dish. Leonis Martin in center. Dejo Lee and Seth Smith both <laughs> pinch hit on opening day. And you might not believe this, Jordan, but uh, Felix Hernandez, who I think you're yeah. familiar with, yeah, yeah he uh, he went six and got the loss, allowing. I mean, that was one Felix's run. like last good season. So. so that's how long. I mean, we're talking about Cattell Marte, uh, yeah. Mariner, hey. and Franklin Gutierrez, professional baseball player. Hey, best hitter, bat second, right? Cattell Marte. Heck yeah, they, they uh, knew. In there. So, right. So just to bring this back to me personally, because I'm a me guy. This is about me. This is my podcast. Can't spell Jordan um, Schusterman without an M and an E. <laughs> Jordan Schusterman. Uh, so again, like Felix Hernandez makes me a Mariners fan, you know, when I'm in high school. But Scott but, service keeps me one. <laughs> right. But, you know, so I get a little, and then I get a little, you know, that's like Eric Wedge, right? I don't really have what, Eric Wedge means nothing to me. And then Lloyd McClendon's there for a couple of years. And then Scott service gets hired when I'm in Denmark. <laughs> when uh, at the end of the, you know, this is our junior year of college. I'm abroad in Copenhagen. I don't remember him getting hired because, again, it was like during the 2015 postseason. And I was watching Noah Syndergaard at five in the morning. So, like, I genuinely don't really remember, like, oh, Scott Service. But the reason why Scott Service got hired originally, and this kind of ties in back to where we are today, is his relationship with Jerry Depoto, which had extended back to them being teammates with the Rockies. They had worked together, I think, with the Rockies. They worked together in Anaheim. Service was the farm director in Texas. He goes over to Anaheim, works for Depoto with the Angels as uh, in their front office for a while. And then when Depoto gets hired at the end of the 2015 season, he says, all right, service is my guy and he will be the manager. And which, you know, okay, they have this long tenure. There's, they completely, I mean, we talk about all the things that have changed all these managers. You just mentioned that lineup. Think about how much roster turnover, you know, when I'm tweeting out all of the latest Jerry DePoto trade, well, Scott service has been there for all of them. <laughs> yes. And has to deal with all of them. <laughs> right. He has had to manage all of those, not just learn people's names, which is already hard enough. Think about how many different guys have shuffled through that, that clubhouse throughout the season, spring training, all these off season, all these guys. I think about how many calls he's had to make to new players they traded for, players they traded away, players, all these things, right? That is talk about having to manage things. I mean, let alone the in-game stuff. That is a lot to deal with. And a lot of that was built on that relationship, that trust, that longstanding connection over years and years as baseball men who are the same age and kind of learn this game together right and so which as we get here to the end where how why why is he being fired now if you haven't been watching the Mariners recently they have the best arguably the best rotation in baseball and they had a 10 game lead over the Astros and now they don't and they no 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 no. not that they just don't they're, They're four or five, five games back. back. Five games back, right. Now, Which was an issue I had with Scott Service's statements, and I don't want to get too ahead of myself. But in it, he said, we were leading the be- <laughs> uh, competitive division I, just days I, ago. That is a... Yeah. I, I like this I could, I, could, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate his statement. I think there was a lot in there where he took the high road, and he's very classy, but I agree. Yeah. That, was, that was definitely my least favorite part of the... <laughs> you of the were... But, you, you were leading the worst division in baseball. Yes, this year. A right? month we, ago. What we thought, what we thought was going to be a competitive <laughs> division, and instead the Rangers are bad. Anyway, certainly top six in competitiveness. So, so they, <laughs> that's true. So they blow the they blow the division lead, but they're still in it. And remember, a week and a half ago, they sweep the Mets in dominating fashion. Just absolutely pants the Mets. They crush them on national television. And while at that point they're still, I think, tied with Houston, um, it was like, okay, like we stabilized it. The offense is looking better. Let's now it's just a fight, right? Now at this point, it's a fight. We got this big road trip coming up, including against two teams that are not very good. Let's see what can happen. And instead, they go one and eight on the road trip in Detroit, Pittsburgh, in LA. They get swept in Detroit. They got blown out in the first game. They lose two two close games. They go to Pittsburgh. They lose to Skeens. They lose on Saturday in more embarrassing fashion. They beat Jake Woodford on Sunday. And then they go to Dodger Stadium and they get outclassed in every sense. Some of those games were sort of close, but it was obvious who the better team was. It wasn't even remotely um, a question. And now they're five games back. And it seems like 
that was certainly the the end. However, as we spin this to who the manager is going to be, which is Dan Wilson, a franchise, a familiar face, the former catcher who has the sixth most games played in franchise history, uh, someone who's been around the organization in multiple different roles, never in a coaching capacity, although he did fill in as a manager in AAA for a few games. He's been in the broadcast. He's been he's around spring training all the time. He is Dan Wilson. Everybody likes Dan Wilson. But the most interesting thing about this decision is when it was first reported, oh, they're naming Dan Wilson. That smells like Band-Aid ownership situation, right? You think, oh, they just need an interim guy to get us through the rest of the season. Let's just bring in a, a fan, you know, a fan favorite, and then we'll figure it out in the winter. That was, I think, everyone's first inclination. It's like, all right, this is a little strange, but we've seen versions of that before when guys are brought in midseason, and so it's like, okay, that's strange. However, when they actually officially announce it, unfortunately, apparently after Scott Service had found out about it via the news, which is embarrassing for everybody involved, whoever made that happen. They say that Dan Wilson is the permanent manager. And that suggests that this was a decision that was in the works for a lot longer than before they got swept by the Dodgers. And to that point, which makes sense because, again, they had blown the lead before then, that kind of changes the tone and really presents a, a fascinating next few months for this organization because as they have capitulated over the last month, all the fan base has said, okay, someone's got to go. Someone's got to get fired. Oh, it's got, of course, everyone wants ownership to change. We know that's not happening. Is it going to be Jerry? Is it going to be Scott? Is it going to be both? It seems like DePoto is going to stay, but the choice to stick with Dan Wilson is a fascinating one. They bring in Edgar Martinez, replaces uh, Jared DeHart, their hitting coach, also let go uh, earlier this week. This is a an interesting bet. And while everybody likes Dan Wilson, I don't really put much talking to people be like, he's never managed before. Like, how, how many times have we been saying that about managers? Sometimes that there's so many guys that haven't managed before that now get to manage. And like, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And I, I just, that doesn't mean a thing to me. To me, it's more about committing to him as the guy moving forward and what that will mean for the rest of this coaching staff. And, and not whether doing that, a search. Not doing a search, right? That is what makes this, I, I don't want to say concerning because I just don't know. But like that's that's what makes this a really big decision and what probably could ultimately mean the end for DePoto if it goes wrong, I would think. But maybe he has more job security than we think. Not giving Wilson the interim tag is very interesting because yeah. it would be yeah. very easy and understandable to do that. Yeah. The Phillies did something similar with Rob Thompson, albeit earlier sure. in the year, a couple of years ago. Sure. Rob did a really good job Snicker. and they kept him around. Obviously, we've seen versions of that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it can happen. It can go this way. But. To just straight up be like, you're the guy is yeah. odd to me. Totally. I think they, if chances are they will lose members of the staff yeah. for next year. Now, is yep. that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Who knows? And I, I the one thing I want to hammer home as an outsider relatively for the Mariners is that they do a lot of things well. This is not a clueless organization. There are issues. With the ideology coming from the top, Jerry DePoto's 54% comment that they just want to win 54% of games, I think highlights some of those issues. I think that also stems from ownership, lack of willingness to spend money, particularly on the offensive side. But what this org has done at the big league level with pitching is the envy of many other clubs in baseball. And that is why this season, the last two months, has been so frustrating is because they do something very difficult outrageously well. Okay? Outrageously well. I think that bringing in a new voice could help. I think it could help. But what was clear to me, and I think to a lot of other people, is that the status quo was not tenable. They could not continue down that road with Scott Service for the rest of the season and not at least try to shake things up. Yeah, because while I understand people being like, the season's over, they're at 500 now, they're five games back of the Astros. Five and a half. Five and a half. Um, <laughs> they have a worse record than Tampa. Are, yeah, right, right. I mean, again, like, it's it's bad. And I, their playoff odds are, I think, down to like 10 or 15%. Um, but hey, 
you still have these guys going out there. I mean, I've said this over the last few months. You still got a pretty good chance to win every time you go out there because you have because Brian Wu is your five starter. You know, like that's you still have that. And so in that theory, in that sense, and the names in the lineup don't look that bad. And so if you could just get some sort of some sort of momentum and some sort of change and whether it's because of Dan Wilson or not, like who knows, but you have to try and at least change something. And that I totally understand with, I think, again, bigger picture, long, longer question, longer term. The big picture thing is, does ownership actually want to change anything more than this? If this team continues to flounder, finishes below 500 I mean, that would just be such a departure from this team that won 88, 90, 90 games over the last three seasons, regardless of where you in the postseason. And then ultimately, if you do decide to move on from DePoto, if and when that happens, how do you make sure that the things that are going really well, obviously the pitching, obviously recently the draft and development of young high school players, you know, now we haven't seen those guys crest at the big league level yet, but there's a reason this team was somehow managed to immediately draft its way back into the top of the farm system rankings and draft guys that you are immediately able to trade for Randy or Rosarena and stuff like that. Like they're doing a lot right. And so if you are going to totally shake it up, how do you ensure that a lot of those things continue to work? So it's a big decision. It is very weird. I don't know. I, I still haven't totally processed with, uh, it. Uh, they return home. They have a, a three-game set at home against the Giants this weekend. I guess we'll hear from Dan Wilson for the first time later today. So I guess that'll be interesting uh, for sure. But um, it sucks. I, I think Scott Service was pretty cool. I, I enjoyed his tenure. I think he had a lot of really high moments. And I totally understand it. getting to this point. It's unfortunate. But I will certainly remember him fondly because he's the guy. I mean, that's that's who I know as the manager. And so I will uh, I will definitely uh, think back on him in, in a positive way for sure. Love it. Let's take a break. When we return, we'll spend three hours talking about the Angels general manager getting an extension. Welcome back. Baseball Barbecast. You already know that. You clicked on it. The Los Angeles Angelus of Anaheim aren't good uh and they haven't been and they don't project to be however they have extended general manager perry manasian through the year of our lord two zero two six this reads weird because if you get an extension as a baseball player typically it is because you have accomplished great things or you are friend of the show randy dobnak i'm kidding randy you have accomplished <laughs> Great things. Oh, we love Randy. Come on now. Just goofing. David Bodie shouts out to you. He had are, what do you mean? When he got that extension, it's like, Randy, yeah. Lock this guy yeah, up. Randy. But it is a nice contrast to the Scott Service discussion in the sense where it's like, oh, yeah, you blow a 10 game lead and then you go one and eight on this road trip that you, you get fired. That's like, yep. Makes sense. You know, I, it's it's unfortunate, whatever this other context. Is. Paranasian, who has been, this is his fourth year as the Angels general manager. They are on pace for their worst season in, I think, 30 years. They still have, I believe they've had a bottom three to one farm system every year that he has been the general manager and continues to be that. Has Perry gotten some young talent to the big leagues through the draft and aggressively pushing them that there is some encouraging signs? Yes. Yes, Neto nailed it. Nailed the Neto pick. Oh, Hoppy trade, awesome. Love that. Brandon Nolan Marsh can buy a hit right now. True. Yeah. Oh, Hoppy, awesome. Right. Shawnuel, very weird player. He's Fine. something. All right, great. You know, some moments along the way, pitching things that Go have happened that. well. Jose Soriano, maybe kind of. Tyler Anderson bounced back. Okay, right. Um, Estevez. Harry said. Right. Not there anymore. What did you say? I said Estevez. Estevez. Who else? Well, there's another guy that's not there anymore. Oh, what's that guy's name? O'Shea Shotani. <laughs> so the Otani O'Shea. is not O'Shea. on the Angels anymore. Yes. Um, however, Artie Moreno said in the press release, over the last four years, Perry and his baseball operations staff have begun to lay the foundation for a bright future of Angels baseball. We have been impressed by the steps Perry has taken to infuse our major league team with young and exciting talent while also revamping our player development process. We believe this extension will allow him to continue the vision of building sustainable success throughout the Angels organization and deliver a championship to our fans. There is one good thing about this. 
this is really the first acknowledgement from Artie Moreno that like we're in a bit of like a process of building. We're not just like we're going for it, which he has still s- suggested, even as they've lost eight consecutive seasons. They have not made the postseason since 2014. This is at least being like we are building something. And in theory, this is allowing, you know, the guy who's been in place to continue to build that. That is true. And I guess I could argue that like bringing in a new guy, what's the new guy going to do? This is such a mess, right? That's fine. I'm fine with all that. However, continuity, there's value continuity. In, in continuity. Totally. That's fine. That's all. That's all true. And so maybe it is that simple. However, obviously, as we mentioned, what 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 has happened where it's like, oh, yeah, this is working out. <laughs> I that I can't see. I really I like Perry. Mm-hmm. OK, as a guy I like Perry, I don't I don't want this to come across like I'm just crapping on Perry. During Perry's tenure, the Angels are tied for 22nd in baseball and wins. They are. 277 and 337. Now, granted, that is tied with the Texas Rangers, who, you know, <laughs> have a World Series ring. So, you know, well, there you go. Just like the Angels. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's difficult for me, though, to judge Perry too hard because he is general managing with one hand behind his back because of the restrictions from ownership about where money could be spent, minor league system development. Um, I I think that it is it is maybe the hardest job. Like I think it's a job you have to take, right? But I think it's a difficult job and I don't think that Perry would have gotten the extension if Artie didn't have a good relationship with Perry, which is both a good and a bad thing. Like part of the reason why DePoto and in, in Anaheim didn't work is cuz he didn't want to completely bow down to Artie at every turn, right? And he got frustrated with it. And so I don't feel particularly optimistic. I don't think that this news really changes how I feel about the Angels over the next couple of years. Yeah. I to be honest with you, I if anything, it makes me feel a little bit better about them. A two-year extension really isn't that big of a sure. we believe in you. Yep. I think we have to table this uh, and see how things pan out. Totally fair. Totally fair. All right, Jake. Uh, it's Friday. It's time for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Something good, something bad, something Dan ugly. What does that mean? I just realized Nolan Gorman got optioned. Our Gen Z Dan ugly. Bad. Um, that's bad. But I'm not going to do that for my bad. So let's stay good. And I'm going to go first. Rysel Iglesias sure. oh. has retired 35 consecutive batters. He retired. He yeah, more what more retirement so talk. Uh, 11th consecutive perfect inning for the Braves closer. Rysel Iglesias, who was promptly salary dumped by the Angels. <laughs> Great move. <laughs> Nailed it, I'm Perry. Perry for uh, Jesse Chavez and Tucker Davidson. Um, is one of the best closers of his generation. Uh, we don't really talk about him that way. Sneaky but- great. This yeah. dude is awesome, and he's Nails. having, I mean, he's having the best season of his career, and he's had a pretty damn good career. He was awesome in Cincinnati. He was very good in Anaheim. He's got 218 uh, career saves, and he's 34. He turns 35 in January, and he's just one of the best relievers on earth, and I don't really feel like we ever talk about him as much, but I feel like if you uh, retire 35 consecutive guys, you should be talked about a, exactly that way. He's a very interesting pitcher. He's a four-pitch reliever, which is one of my favorite kind of relievers. We're so used to the fastball and slider guy. Uh, this guy's got two different fastballs. His changeup is, is probably his best pitch. And um, he's just nasty. He's incredible. And, like, he's another part of why, like, as decimated as the Braves are, like, I don't really want to play them. <laughs> Not a team I'm super thrilled. To, like, I don't care how bad this lineup gets. Like, you want to face Chris Sale and Rizal Iglesias in game one? All right. Sounds sounds good to me. Uh, yeah. So, Rice Iglesias, very, 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 very good. My good is Aaron Judge. I don't know if listeners nice are familiar. Nice little ball player. With his work. You know, he could do a lot of things for your club. Yeah. Um, kind of. He really does one thing supremely well, and that is to take the ball and to dispatch it. Into the seats, which he did four times in this most recent series against Cleveland. 
upping his home run total on the year to 48. In 2022, he hit 62 home runs, and now he's on pace for 61. And as a whole, Aaron Judge has been better, straight up freaking better this year than he was in 2022 when he broke the AL home run record and won the MVP. His OPS is higher. His OPS plus is higher. He is walking more. He's striking out less. He is hitting for a higher average. Aaron Judge is so freaking good, dude. He's so good. The home run he hit yesterday off Gavin Williams looked like a foul ball, and it just turned into a home run. We have reached this point, and this has happened with Judge before, where the size of the field almost doesn't feel fair, and it is comparable to watching the Little League World Series. Thank you. Where you, Aaron you Judge were way just ahead was. of me. This is why we've worked together for 10 years. This is exactly the point I was going to make. And I think I talked about this in t- two years ago, but it is appropriate as we are watching the Little League World Series now. It is like watching the big kid that is the best kid on the Little League team. It's like, oh, we and, hit it down the opposite oh, wow. field. That's not going to go, is it? Whoa, right. it's seven it's like, rows. Oh, wow. Deep. He hit it onto the, the hill at, at Lomity in Williamsport. It's like, yeah, he's huge. <laughs> duh. Like, he's too big for the field. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's what we're watching with this major league player. And I don't care. Oh, the short porch. Okay. Like, no, no, don't care. Like, he's Sorry. 726. He's, I mean, and is yeah, he underrated? That, yeah. He's underrated again. Yeah. Um, I just, and guess what? He has more home runs on the road. So I don't like, uh, we should talk. It's the same thing with Otani. It's, it's like, we should talk about him every show. I, I, I'm, I'm running out of words, but I mean, we will get to maybe have another conversation about him having a legitimately historic season. Not that we aren't already, but from a home run standpoint, why, why can't, I mean, again, I, I imagine he's going to start getting walked even more, but we will, uh, we will see. Cause he's, uh, that's, that is exactly the feeling that I have is he is too large for this field and for this league. I don't want to get into this dumb discourse, but would you switch Soto and Judge in the order? Um, probably. I haven't like I haven't thought about that that much, and I haven't watched it up close enough to know. Um, I think like, I know the, Soto's whole thing is that he walks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the more dramatic thing to ask is, should they be batting first and second? <laughs> <laughs> like, just get him I, up there, dude. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not really joking. Like, I, I would hit I, him eighth and ninth with like disguises. Be like, but, oh, yeah, yeah this, but is, like, uh, this is honestly like our new catcher. W- w- they're so much better than everybody else. I know you like want the guy to get on base, but it's like their at bats are so ridiculously valuable that if you're getting any more than you already are, like, I could see an argument for just Soto leadoff, which I don't know if I don't remember what Soto's leadoff experience is but anyway so or judge leadoff whatever anyway so that that would be a question I would be asking more than flipping them because it's like these guys should be batting as much as possible because obviously um my well you want to do bad first yeah the Orioles optioned Trevor Rogers yeah Mm. yeah the Orioles deadline my biggest concern with it at the time was that they were acquiring players who had the chance if given time to develop turn into real contributors. Trevor Rogers is a young lefty with a lot of team control who's who's a first-round pick and has had good years in the past. So Anthony Dominguez and Gregory Soto had both been high-leverage relievers, very valuable ones at points in time. Zach Eflin, that I liked. (laughs) So far, it has gone. But yeah. He's hurt now. (laughs) So far, it has gone exactly how I thought it would go. (laughs) Rogers has been mid. He was sent down to AAA so that the Orioles could keep Cole Irvin around, who I believe was out of options. The guy that they traded for a year and a half ago to do Trevor Rogers stuff. (laughs) And the two relievers, Soto has an ERA. I believe you can fact check me on this turn. I believe it's over 15, which is I don't know the last time he pitched, but uh, let's see. Uh, Soto with the Orioles rocking the old. Oh, no, it's not. It's 1271. He brought it to oh. 15. And then Sir Anthony Dominguez, who looked pretty good at first, allowed two walk-off home runs this week to the New York Mets. And this is so disappointing. Be- I say this all the time. Teams are working with more information than we are. I really struggle to judge things with limited information. This has gone just so, it has been so predictable and so frustrating because 
this Orioles team is really good and really talented, and they could have used an, just an impact, legitimate impact, no joke reliever right now who can get outs. Even like Mark Leiter Jr., who I know has not been great recently for the Yankees, they needed something more bankable than the guys they got. I knew it. A lot of other people on the public side knew it. People who were running other teams that we talked to knew it. And it is just the first piece of evidence that this front office, while unbelievable at getting the team to this point and deserving a ton of credit for that, Mm -hmm. right? The Orioles would not be this good and have a future this bright without these people. I understand that. First shred of evidence that maybe that job is different than creating a competitive roster. Maybe those two things are a little bit different. We'll see. But it has not been very encouraging. My bad and my ugla could go in either direction. I'm actually going to swap them and I'm going to do my bad uh, that was originally going to be my ugla. And that was a tweet from uh, our friend Liam Fennessy, quote tweeting a tweet from Boston Sports Gordo. And Boston Sports Gordo, I'm not familiar with his work, but he put out something that I just agree with wholeheartedly. This is not a bad tweet. This is just something that I've wanted to rant about. And I maybe have already done on the show. So sorry if I'm repeating myself. <laughs> it is a picture of the Red Sox team store from many years ago. And he, the tweet is, I miss when the Red Sox team store looked like this and you could get any jersey you wanted because they had it, even if it was Ryan Hannigan. Thank you. And Liam uh, quotes with this is saying, remember what they took from you. This is bad. This is Fanatics' biggest crime is that jerseys are dead. Yeah. They have killed the art of getting a jersey of anybody that you want, which should be, this should not be complicated to put a name and a number on the back of a t-shirt. We're not asking for the, I don't need the authentic $300 jersey of the backup catcher. I want the $35 t-shirt, okay? We talk about this all the time. This, if you're a fan, especially a franchise like the Red Sox, where like everybody loves all of the players, like that, it's so obvious. Remember, Jake, one of my, what's one of my favorite jerseys that I have? Solarte, Yankees. Where did I get it? Right outside Yankee Stadium. I don't know if you could still get like random, can, like, can you get, how easy is it to even get a Ben Rice jersey? Like, I have no idea. I know it's nearly impossible online and it just breaks my heart. It sucks. And maybe this is a niche complaint for dorks like us. I'm sure it is. But for me, it's bad. I wish people could get jerseys more easily. There are online wonky versions of name number. Yeah, but they're not paraphernalia they're, available but it's not it's not a version of the jersey as a t-shirt and no, that is because no. they want to take all your money yeah well, that's it like they, they want, want you to, to buy well, the jersey they want to spend less money on making ryan hannigan jerseys and that's a shame because they no, should. but that but that's not even it dude like you used to be able to go to mlb the shop right and you could go to where it's a select player and yeah. you could scroll down the roster you can still do this but it, it's it's a little bit different now and you could select, you know, Connor Wong mm-hmm. and you could order a Connor Wong shirt to your house. Mm-hmm. Right. And you can't do that with like the the, the jersey. Look no, it looks it's anymore. like a janky T-shirt. It's like not the same hate thing. It. So hate it. anyway, hate it, breaks hate my it. heart. It's bad. It's definitely bad. Anyway, what's uh, OK? So let's let's go to Ugla. Um, yep. I I'll do Ugla now just because my Ugla could also be bad. But it is it is it is a picture. It's Rodery Munoz. How much have you watched Rodery Munoz of the Miami Marlins this year? And if the answer is not a single inning, that's okay. I've watched him pitch. I can't say that he's one of my favorite artists. <laughs> he's in bad. He could have been in bad because his FIP is nearly seven, which is like one of the worst we've seen from a starting pitcher in you know this century. He's allowing two and a half home runs per nine, which is like so far and away the worst home run rate in the league. He's only in the Marlins rotation because the whole Marlins rotation is on the IL, right? That's the only reason this guy is regularly starting like every fifth day for the Marlins. But I'm putting him in Ugla because I watch this guy. You watch him for the right one inning and you're like, this guy's the nastiest guy I've ever seen. Like, he's, and yet, it, it is such a great reminder of how hard this sport is and how good major league hitters are that like if your fastball is just slightly the wrong shape and your command is slightly bad, you are going to get absolutely obliterated. Like you watch this guy's slider and his face throwing 96 and his slider sharp and it's like, oh man, look at this guy. And like he's had some decent outings, but on the whole, 
he's been horrible. Like, absolutely, like, argument for worst starting pitcher in the league. And it's just so funny. This sport is hilarious. I watch him. I'm like, man, this guy's nasty. He sucks. In what year, going <laughs> backwards, does Rodery Munoz win the Cy Young? Because if he's pitching in 1903, he doesn't allow a run okay Correct. he's maybe he walks in you know maybe he, he maybe. walks him in but the the hits allowed is like microscopic yeah in what year what is the most recent year in which rottery munoz wins in the saga <laughs> it's i'll say oh man i don't john know john smoltz is watch out john smoltz is gonna kill you yeah yeah <laughs> He definitely wins it during World War II. Sorry, Hal Newhauser. I'll take Rodery Munoz <laughs> over over Newhauser. How about that? So Anything the first year that? they awarded the Cy Young was 1956. Oh, right. right. That's true. So that's a little bit later. I will. This feels really disrespectful, but like that, I kind of want to say it out loud. <laughs> I want to say this sentence out loud. I think Munoz beats out Koufax. <laughs> oh my god! I was gonna say like I don't want to like maybe before Gibson, but like uh, not Koufax. Other league maybe, <laughs> maybe. Did, anyway, Rodri Munoz is my ugla. Uh, what's your ugla? And then we can say goodbye. <laughs> uh, the Guardians. I watched them play baseball this week in person for the first time this year. I can't tell if they're gonna win the World Series or they stink. I think the answer could be both. They do the little things so well and the big <laughs> things so. so relatively poorly. Like when you watch them specifically against the Yankees, right? Right. All right. Th that the physicality is gap is just <laughs> not fair. It's not fair. It yeah. feels like a different thing. Thank God they have John Kenzie Noel because yes. he is doing a lot of work to make sure that these two teams look like they belong in the same field. And the Guardians are good. They entered this series a half game apart of one another. And I think Cleveland could totally beat New York in a five-game set when they're using all their A relievers over and over and over again and they're shortening games and every extra base matters and they're just going to walk Judge and Soto every time. <laughs> but like, man, what a weird team, dude. What a yeah. weird freaking team. Well, I'll see them later today. I'll be at the Guardians a lot over the next week as the Rangers, Royals, and Pirates come to town. Um, I will point out, like, you know, last year they were last in home runs by a whopping margin. They were they were 26 or seven home runs behind the 29th place Nationals. This year they're above average in homers. I mean, it's not like they're the Yankees, but like they, they're they've. You know, it's they've escalated a little bit to it's not quite as small ball centric. And, you know, guys like Noel have helped that. But the spirit of it and the aesthetic of the Guardians has very much remained intact. So, I oh, agree. the vibe is it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's that the Guardians, these Guardians are in the mix and probably still the favorite to win a division and, this year right. with yeah. the way that baseball looks is so cool that we can have different styles of teams yes. be competitive. Yes. yes. That being said, I think I'd rather have Aaron Judge. But that's just me. Well, same. Um, I will also say that like Monday was a great, you know, reminder of that. Or I guess Tuesday. Perfect. Tuesday. Perfect. <laughs> you know, I know they got their ass kicked the next two games, but outlasting them, the Yankees in 12 and, you know, drawing all those walks uh was was just delightful so anyway guards see you in a see you in a few hours looking forward to seeing them as always um but that's our show that's our podcast we're gonna retire uh, this episode <laughs> um, it's just not good anymore we <laughs> let us know if we're ever going past when we're good email us, us baseball barbacast yeah. gmail.com we really appreciate the feedback thank you to andrew hearts for producing everyone enjoy your weekend we will be back uh, next week to talk about my review of the Guardians and see if Dan Wilson is the greatest manager in <laughs> Mariners <laughs> history. Uh, have a good week, everybody.